Okay, so this is the spectrometer that we use in Surrey, but the ones that we use in Richmond, although they look different than this, roughly work on the same principles. So you've got a telescope, that's the part that moves around, and you've got a collimator, which is fixed, and there's also a table, which rotates on the top of this. That's not the little black table, it's the table underneath it. Now you can lock the telescope and the table independently. I'm going to show you where the knobs are for the Surrey apparatus, but they'll be in slightly different locations for the Richmond apparatus. To lock the telescope, which is currently freely moving, there's a little knob down here. And so I tighten that up and now the telescope does not move. The table here moves back and forth and there's a knob over on this side where you can't quite see. If I tighten that up, then this table no longer moves. Now the rule when you're taking data with this apparatus is that if you're moving the telescope around, you want the table locked and vice versa. If you're moving the table, you also want the telescope locked. So either the telescope's locked or the table is locked at all times. The reason why is that these things aren't quite as independent as we'd like. When you move the telescope a little bit, that tends to move the table also. And vice versa, if you move the table when the telescope's unlocked, that tends to move the telescope a little. So these two things can screw up your data taking. There's a scale here on the Surrey apparatus that allows you to take measurements. So when you look through the telescopes, you'll see some crosshairs. And you can put that on a spectral line or on the central image and take a reading here. Now you've got a lamp over on this side here. I'll turn it on so you can see. And as I will show in the next part of the video, the position of the lamp can make a big difference to how bright things look when you look through the telescope. So it's a good idea to take this thing and first of all, make sure that the tube is right up close to the slit on the collimator and then to move it back and forth with very small motions while looking through the telescope and making sure that your central image looks as bright as possible. I'll turn that off because it buzzes a little bit. You've got a prism and you should take a look at it because usually they've got two clear sides and one fogged side and you want the two clear sides to be in the very center of your black table on top. You want it to be at a fairly steep angle because the light from the collimator is going to come in at a glancing angle, bend when it enters the prism, bend again as it leaves, and your spectral lines will be over here. And then you'll swing your telescope over and have a look at them. What's kind of interesting is that if you actually stick your face here, you can see those spectral lines with your naked eye. You look into the prism and you'll be able to see those spectral lines. You've been given a piece of black cloth. You can use this to make a little tent over top of the spectrometer. Uh, this just helps the background to look darker. It's optional, but it's a good idea because it helps you see your spectral lines. Just be aware that if the cloth kind of sags, it can block some of the light coming through your collimator and your telescope and make things really difficult to see. So just be careful that it is tinted up nice and high and that it's not sagging into the line of sight. Can also knock your prism askew. So again, just be a little bit careful with the black cloth but it does help to put that over just to block some of the stray light in the room. Now I'm going to show you in the next part of the video how you take data, but the rough idea of what you'll be doing is to begin with, you make sure your table is locked, and you would turn on the lamp, and the light comes straight through the collimator into the telescope. Some of it is leaking past the tip of this prism, and some of it's going into the prism and bending over here. So the light that goes past the tip that allows you to see what's called the central image. So it's a bright vertical slit of light that's coming from the lamp through the slit on the end of the collimator. So you'd see that, make sure it's nice and bright by adjusting the position of the lamp. And then you'd swing over here, find your spectral lines, and then you need to find what's called the angle of minimum deviation. And I'll explain more in the next part of the video how you do that. But the rough idea here is you would, at that point, lock your telescope so it can't move. You unlock the table, and then you'll swing the table back and forth a little bit while looking through the telescope. And what you'll see is you'll see your spectral lines, and when you move the table, they'll appear to move back and forth across your view. And you want to move the table in such a way that the lines move back towards the central image. So the central image was here, you're trying to make the spectral lines that you're seeing over here move this way. And what you'll notice is at a certain point, even though you're turning the table in the same direction, the lines swing this way and then they stop and change direction and they start heading the other way even though you're still moving the table in the same direction. 
So that's called the angle of minimum deviation, when they're as far this way as possible, at that point where they change direction. So you would play around with the table until the line is as far this way as it can be, and then you'd lock your table, and you'd unlock the t telescope, and you put your crosshairs right on the line, and you take a reading. And then with this table still locked, you go back to your central image, and you put the crosshairs on it, and you take another reading. So one minus the other, that angle is the angle of minimum deviation that you need for your calculations. And you'll go through that process for every spectral line. So when you first look through the spectrometer, you should have the telescope lined up parallel with the collimator. So you're looking straight through towards the light source. And you should see a vertical slit like this, but you may not see very much at first because the brightness of that slit depends very sensitively on the positioning of your lamp. So if you move the lamp around a little bit, I'll do that now, you can see it makes a huge difference to how bright that line looks. And indeed, if you haven't got things lined up properly, you may not see much of anything at all. So, you look through there, it's a good idea to take your lamp and move it right up to the slit on the collimator, and then very carefully adjust it back and forth until you get that line looking as bright as possible. So when it looks nice and bright, then you can start the experiment. I will warn you, however, that often you find that the spectral lines look brightest when the lamp is at a slightly different position. So that means that the central image might not look as bright as possible, but it makes the spectral lines look as bright as possible. That may or may not happen with your apparatus, but if you find that the spectral lines don't look very bright, again, try adjusting your lamp a little to try and get them nice and bright. As long as you can see the central image, that's good enough for you to take data from. So this is the central image viewed through the spectrometer. So you can see the crosshairs, and if I move the telescope back and forth a little bit, you see that the crosshairs don't move relative to the camera, but the central image does. So you're going to eventually be putting your crosshairs on the central image and taking a reading, but you can't do that yet because first you have to get the prism oriented such that you find the angle of minimum deviation for a certain spectral line. So let's do that now. So I'm going to move the telescope over to find the spectral lines. So this will look like a big blur until I get there. There we go. So here's the first of the spectral lines. It may not look red on the camera, but that's the color it is. And if I go a little farther, I see a teal colored line. And there is also a purple one there, although it's a little hard to see. So for the demonstration, I'm going to go back to the red one just because it's easiest for you to see. So I've been moving the telescope around, and the rule is that when the telescope is moving around, the table must be locked, and vice versa. When the table's moving, the telescope must be locked. So right now, I've got my table locked and my telescope free. It's able to swing around. So now I want to reverse that. I want to lock my telescope and then unlock the table. So I'll do that now but you're not going to see that. And once I've got that set up, now I can move my table, but my telescope is locked in place. So what does moving the table actually do? So I'll show you, is if I twist the table in one direction, it causes the line to move across the screen. So the line is shifting its position, and I can move it back and forth. Now I moved the telescope in this direction to find the spectral lines. In order to find my angle of minimum deviation, I want the lines to move in this direction, back towards the central image. So I need to move my table such that the lines travel in that direction. So I'll start doing that, and it's entirely possible that this will happen, that the spectral line will actually fall off the edge of my view. So if that happens, then you need to lock the table, unlock the telescope, and go and center that line in your viewfinder again. So I'll do that now. So I lock my table, and I unlock my telescope, and now I move my telescope in order to center that line again. So approximately like that. And then again, I lock the telescope in place, and I unlock my table. So now I can move the table again. And again, I want to move the table in such a way that that line moves towards the central image again. So I keep doing that. And what you will see 
At a certain point, that line changed direction. I wasn't changing the direction that I was turning the table, however. So I'll reverse direction now, and you see it creep towards the central image, and then turn around. I'm still turning the table the same direction. The line changed direction. So when that line is as close to the central image as possible, that's your angle of minimum deviation. That's what you're looking for. So I'm going to move this back and forth to try and find that angle of minimum deviation when the line's as close to the central image as possible. So that's roughly there. So once I've found it, then I lock my table and I unlock my telescope, because now I want to put the crosshairs on that line and take a reading. So I lock the table, and now I've unlocked my telescope, and I'm going to, as carefully as possible, try and put my crosshairs right on that line. So let's call that on top of the line. So I put my crosshairs right on top of the line. And now you turn on the lights and you take a reading off of this. So you take a measurement off the scale. Now you're not done at that point. You have to go back to the central image and take a reading off of that. The central image does change because we're moving the table around. So every time you find that angle of minimum deviation for a line, you have to lock the table, take a reading off of the line itself, and then go back and take a reading off the central image. So you take a reading off the central image every single time. So I'll do that now. I've got my table still locked, and I've taken my reading for this spectral line. So now I can move back to the central image. And when I find that, again, I put my crosshairs right on the line as accurately as I can. So let's say that's close enough. And then I would take another reading here. So you've taken two readings, one off the spectral line, one off the central image. One minus the other gives you that angle of minimum deviation that you need for your calculations. So now we found the angle of minimum deviation for the red line. We have to go back and find the angle of deviation for all the other lines. The angle will be slightly different for every single spectral line. So it'll be similar to what you found for the red line, but it won't be the same. So you have to go back and do every single one individually. So again, I'll swing over to the spectral lines. And I would go find the next line, which in this case is this turquoise one. And then again, it would be a case of I'd lock the telescope in place unlock the table, and then I'd start moving the table back and forth to find that angle of minimum deviation, where it's as close to the central image as possible. And as you can see, it's very, very close to the same angle that I had for the red line, but you'll find that it's not quite the same. So when you think you've got it as close to the central image as possible, that is as far this way as possible, then you would lock the table, put the crosshairs right on the teal line, I'm not very good at actually getting this right on top. Take a reading. Once you've got that reading, then you move back to the central image. Put the crosshairs right on it. And take another reading. So like I said, every single time you have to go back to the central image and take a reading just because when we're moving the table around, the reading for the central image will change every time.